So we're going to wait just a few minutes um, uh, for our candidates, our interview candidates to file in. And Dr. Uh, Fazal has um, a University of Kentucky Family Medicine uh, resident sort of en, en route and would um, like the audience to have um, some of his experiences shared. Um, so we'll wait just a few more minutes.
Good morning and welcome to the ETSU Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Today we welcome Dr. Fazal, um, who is uh, currently the Chief uh, of Psychiatry and Medical Director at the Appalachian Regional Hospital in Hazard. Yes. Uh, beautiful Hazard there, remote albeit. Um, Dr. Fazal completed his undergraduate training at the Pakistan Embassy School and College in Saudi Arabia. He attended the King Edward Medical College um, at Punjab University in Lahore, Pakistan. He also completed his psychiatry residency training at um, the Albany Medical Center um, and has a fellowship in psychosomatic medicine at, um, that was completed at Westchester Medical School in Valhalla, New York. Um, and he has been in Appalachia now for how many years? Five years. Five, five years. Yeah. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, that part of Kentucky is very remote. And today he's going to be sharing some of his experiences um, in practicing psychiatry in that part of the country. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Now, let me just have an idea of my residence. I was told residence in the corners. <laughs> okay. And here. And the medical students. Okay, mix. Okay. And then what is this? All right, faculty. All right, cool. Awesome. Well, um, this is Hazard, beautiful little town um, in eastern Kentucky, once known as Queen of Eastern Kentucky because of coal industry, but now really suffering uh, because of the changes in financial status of and economy in general. Uh, let me just go back because I have to do this, and we're not in slideshow, but that's fine. Disclosure thing. So no, I don't have any financial interest or anything. Uh, this is pure dedication and uh, love for the residents, uh, partly, <laughs> to present this thing to you guys. Let me just correct this real quick so that it's clear. to just slides, yeah. but I'll start anyways. So I've, I've, my thing was after my training, uh, I was a foreign medical grad and I had to serve in an underserved area as my favorite job. Uh, interviewed at several places. There were places in remote areas which were one clinic with two social workers and desperately looking for a psychiatrist to sit there and cover the remote area. And there are other options like um, Appalachian Regional Health, which is a, a nonprofit organization, has a chain of about 10 hospitals. They recently acquired another hospital, Barberville, with their own psychiatric services. But then again, uh, moving from New York to Eastern Kentucky was a huge challenge. Uh, but luckily, uh, like I said, there are challenges, but it's also an open canvas. Uh, uh, I do. I am involved in multiple things over there as department chief, also affiliated with some of the universities, involved in teaching, do my own practice. Five years, not bad. It works out eventually. Uh, this is uh, my resident who I'm waiting on, actually. I hope he makes it here. He helped me with this presentation, did most of the research work. So I've been asked to talk about psychiatry and rural health. Well, rural health, well, we need to understand that uh, before we go to rural health, there are federally declared underserved areas in this country, about 2,000 or 2,100 designated areas, which have their own uh, designated seats. Uh, Appalachian have Appalachian Commission, which has about, I think, 30 seats. Conrad 30 program, every state has that uh, to fill those seats up to serve in, the, in their federally declared medically underserved areas. <coughs> so, so some of the stats, about 25% of the US population does live in rural areas, uh, and only 10% of the physician work in those rural areas. So the, there is a severe shortage uh, of uh, providers in these areas to begin with. And the economy is not good, as we know, especially in eastern Kentucky. Coal mines, that was the main business. They're shutting down. The last one in Hazard is about to shut down. So the only source of uh, 
jobs over there is Appalachian Regional Health for the local people, for the major uh, employer. Uh, they have transportation difficulties. In, in Eastern Kentucky, there is no such thing as uh, buses or trains or uh, subways which people can utilize as compared to metro uh, areas. And then uh, coming to our main issue, mental health services, 20% uh, of non-metropolitan counties lack mental health services versus 5% of metropolitan counties. Uh, to give you an example, in whole eastern Kentucky from London to Pikeville, there is one psychiatrist in London with affiliate of St. Joe's and they have few which come from Lexington. In Hazard, it's only me who does practice and there is another child psychiatrist who does once a week and then the next one is in Pikeville. We do have our department, but those are the psychiatrists we have in department are purely inpatient. So practically speaking, the whole mental health system in Eastern Kentucky depends on nurse practitioners and PAs in absence of, and we'll talk about some of the things uh, we're doing in these rural areas to facilitate the provision of mental health. Uh, abuse of alcohol, smokeless tobacco, significant problem, high suicide rate, and uh, some of the financial issues to the rural hospitals as well. Uh, and it's, it's true for the staff too. Uh, not only physicians, they can probably pull up some resources to acquire physicians. They really have more difficulty in maintaining paramedic staff uh, because of the financial situation and economy. Uh, so this is just an average of a uh, number of mentally unhealthy days, well, non-significant. But what's significant is look at the ratio of mental health providers uh, in Kentucky. Uh, generally speaking, uh, and these numbers are opposite, I think. The one provider per average is 621, one provider per 11 to 28,000 population, which is huge number, severe deficiency. Sorry about that, these numbers are flipped over. Okay, so some of the common presentations we see, and they're not in any order, but I can uh, talk about them in order. The most common thing we see is substance abuse and overdose deaths and comorbid psych issues, if they have any, or they're secondary to substance abuse and dependency issues. Second most common thing we see in that area is depression and anxiety. And what I've started to call as a separate entity, the benzo syndrome. I had a patient in my clinic come in yesterday, all the way from Harlan, which is about two hour drive from Hazard. Sitting there, first thing she says to me, I'm here only because I have nerve problem, I need my clonopin. I'm like, okay. Uh, I was, I mean, what do you say to that patient at that time? I'm like, uh, why you have come all the way from Harlan to Hazard? Because there is a psychiatrist sitting over there. Uh, well, they don't prescribe it to me anymore. I'm like, I wonder why. <laughs> but anyways, I gave her some emergency supply and referred her to pro proper uh, primary care. We have to give primary care referral, but my practice is I do not prescribe benzos. But anyway, so that, this is one of the issues we face there. Bipolar disorder, very commonly diagnosed and I think overdiagnosed in those regions. Why? Because uh, nurse practitioners are not going to diagnose, no, nothing against them if there's any sitting here. They're wonderful when it comes to serving, but they're not trained in a way to diagnose personality disorders like you folks are. And most often when we see them, when they come to us, they're already on tons of medications, uh, polypharmacy, and multiple drugs in the same group with a diagnosis of bipolar or schizoaffective, another very common diagnosis. But eventually it turns out if you take a history, they probably have some sort of cluster B uh, personality with associated symptoms. And, uh, and so, so the, by the t there is a lack of appropriate diagnostic approach at initial level, first onset, and then when they come in chronic stage, 
they're further messed up because of the way they've been managed with multiple medications. So bipolar is probably uh, another very common di diagnosis we see. Suicides, suicide attempts are very common. And they're, and I guess and when you go to rural areas, especially like Eastern Kentucky, you have to redefine what is a suicide attempt. Uh, it is an intent to harm yourself, but it's also an intent to escape from police because you're in possession of drugs. So there was this guy who was, uh, had some crystal meth and cops were after him. So he, what he does is jumps into the creek, doesn't care if he dies or nothing, comes in hypothermia, they call me for counsel. He goes, well, I was trying to get away from cops. At that point, I didn't care if I die or live. So when that patient comes to ER, immediately they put it as suicide attempt, psych consult. Anyways, 4.3 million residents out of 4.3 million, 181,000 adults live with serious mental illness. 45,000 children live with serious mental health conditions. Suicide is the 11th leading cause of death overall and third leading cause of death among youth and young adults aged between 15 and 24. And public mental health system in Kentucky provides services to only 80%, 18% of adults who live with serious mental illnesses in the state. So what do we have in East Kentucky? We have acute inpatient facility. Um, Appalachian Regional Health has 100 bed psych inpatient facility which is in contract with the state to serve as a state hospital slash private nonprofit organization. Uh, Long-term facilities, let me clarify that. Long-term facilities mean nursing homes. We don't have long-term psych hospitals. There's, I don't think that exists anymore, anywhere. Uh, unless you're talking about some uh, Creedmoor or some older hospitals in this country. Uh, drug rehab centers and addiction centers which uh, commonly among population over there are known as pill mills. <laughs> but what they are actually are suboxone clinics, which are not that significantly regulated, but the state is now uh, coming up with some legislative steps to regulate them more. And then we have comprehensive care uh, clinics. So how it works is that, or it was working up until recently was that Patient would come in inpatient and the comprehensive cares which are regional, uh, just there is one on north, south, east, west, east, west. They are according to regional, the demographic counties they cover. Hospital gets into contract with them that they have to make outpatient appointments with them. So traditionally, practice is to give two weeks supply, discharge them, try to get an appointment in two weeks. What happens is, they go and get an appointment with some intake person who's probably most of the time is CSW who does intake, is not a psychologist, is not a proper uh, therapist. And then the actual appointment they get uh, to see a provider who can actually manage their medications is probably after another month. So high recidivism too. They come back, they don't follow up with their appointment, run out of meds, they're back in ER. So super utilizers, very common in those areas. But this is, in a nutshell, the structure we have. It's this very, it's nothing actually. We have some SCL from mental retardation, which are run by private group of people who get funded by the state for that. Nursing homes are also owned by private uh, investors. They get some funding for that. But generally speaking, there is no systematic uh, or organized structure. And this is true for most of the rural areas. It's not only in Eastern Kentucky, also Western Pennsylvania is not very different. I interviewed there for a few jobs, same structure. Socioeconomic status has a lot to do with it. They're, like we talked about, coal mine industry is shutting down. Uh, it's a huge stigma. Patient comes in, uh, their typical complaint is, I'm not crazy, I just have problem with my nerves. They don't know what depression is, they don't know what, uh, uh, what, is, what is a nerve problem. Their nerve problem might just simply be, okay, 
I'm, I'm getting angry every time I drink. But they call it nerve problem. They don't consider it as something which could have been happening because of alcohol or let's say cocaine or crystal meth. Everything is a nerve problem. And solution for everything is Xanax. Uh, unemployment, very common. And hazard only, and this is true for most of Eastern Kentucky, the ratio of employed uh, residents of the county is three to one in favor of females. You'll often see single mothers or females supporting households through what industry? Health industry. Most of them, they're families and families in one hospital. Oh, my niece works there, my daughter works there, which is fine, it's good. But unfortunately, due to coal mining business getting down, a lot of the males are unemployed now. And uh, smoking, of course, and I think it's, it's cigarettes are cheaper in Virginia. I'm, I'm not gonna be, uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about it because I smoke too, but <laughs> it is a huge problem. Uh, I think the reason the suicide is lower down on uh, uh, death rates is because lung cancer is very high over there in coal miners' lungs. So what are some of the barriers uh, we have generally in rural areas? Fewer providers and even fewer specialty providers. Uh, distance to access providers, insurance coverage, and then local stigma for help, especially for mental health. And I think also, uh, and, and we will talk about it, because as residents, you have to look into a lot of things when you're looking for your jobs and looking at places you want to work for. Uh, you, you look for a characteristic of that location, community, what are the demands, the stress level, uh, there are a lot of recruitment and retention barriers. We can recruit a lot of locum, surprisingly. Why? Because the crime rates are super high. An average psychiatrist would probably range from, uh, as employed, probably 100 to 120 an hour. As a locum, you can make up to 200. Why not? And those agents, they make money on top of you too. So yeah, we can get locums we cannot get permanent staff to stay there for more than six months. There are some reasons for that. There are reimbursement barriers for the hospitals and for the clinics in general, but there are some incentives which state has given to overcome these. Administrative barriers, very interesting. Um, the philosophy in rural areas is my people and my people. So you will see administration running into the family too, a lot of times. And it, it just, it's structured in a way that it works out fine for people in that locality. It becomes a trouble for someone who goes in and tries to adjust. Your work atmosphere might not be what you would be expecting as compared to a metropolitan area where it is fast paced, high turnover, and very objective. Most of the administration is very subjective. Uh, and passive aggressive. They're not upfront. So you, you got to learn the local politics also. Very important, should be mentioned in here. And information and resource barriers. So, yes, uh, you would expect metropolitan areas to have earlier access to these latest information, then transitioning into these rural areas. We have aging population, socioeconomic factors we talked about, um, attitudes, behavior to illness, same as stigma, access travel time, we talked about these things. Yes, aging population. Another major thing is mass migration. Uh, I think in Hazard and Perry County alone, we, the institution we have is uh, a community college, that's the maximum. And then there is, in the next county, there is another college, Ellis Lloyd. And then there is University of Pikeville in Pikeville. And then it's University of Kentucky. And for a town 
like Hazard, which if you look at the town population alone is not more than 7,000. Perry County's population is what, 65,000? There's a mass migration of younger generations. So more and more uh, 80 plus patients are coming in, again, over or misdiagnosed as dementia without any uh, diagnostics, just because they start acting in a particular way or they're presenting as a typical depression or they're having some sort of infections or lack of care, uh, which is increasing. So yeah, that's, that's the important aspect of that uh, area. Characteristics group. Uh, then there's local availability of healthcare services, which is primarily based on rural health clinics and uh, the hospital. Uh, limited support for the caregivers, limited consumer involvement in service planning. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, there is no customer service in these areas. So these are fancy words, consumer and non service plan. But yes, there is no concept of customer service uh, because there is no industry, health industry in rural areas. Uh, so with industry comes the concept of consumer service. Uh, and then uh, the most important thing is informal mental health care. Uh, I don't know if uh, any one of you has experienced, everyone is a doctor. Where did you get the pill from? Oh, the guy next to me told me that he's my neighbor, he's my cousin, he told me, that'll help your nerves, that'll help your seizures, take it. I don't know what it could do, next thing you know you're on the ventilator. So there's a lot of, even uh, uh, unfortunately, I have to blame some of my own colleagues who are involved in primary care physician and have been doing that informal type of health care which probably was fine about 30, 40 years ago. But now it's the era of evidence-based practice. You can't just simply uh, treat patients by word of mouth. But it exists, trust me. It still exists in these areas. OK, so now coming to mental health clinicians. Uh, Limited supply of specialist mental health clinicians, professional isolation, limited peer support, dual, multiple, or overlapping relationships. It's a small word. Well, we talked about that. Complex confidentiality issues, multiple role requirements, limited training and rule setting for providers. These uh, are true limitations. Like I said, uh, basically, you're looking about 80 mile radius. Uh, surviving on uh, five psychiatrists, and welcome, uh, Dr. Krishna. Please have a seat over there. Thank you. Uh, and one of them is a child psychiatrist who doesn't want to work as a child psychiatrist. She's aging. She's a very good psychiatrist, but she works once a week. Rest of them are all adult psychiatrists. So we're talking about a huge area of about 100-mile radius depending solely on five to six psychiatrists for outpatient services. Uh, professional isolation, yes. Uh, luckily, uh, Appalachian Regional Health, and, and my advice to you guys is that whenever, if there is anyone who has to do waiver job, uh, you'll have tons of invitations, agents sending you tons of emails about job opportunities, this, that, and that, and no weekends and that. Make sure you look for one thing at least. Work in a multidisciplinary practice. Do not go to an isolated clinic where you're the only psychiatrist in 60 miles work sitting with a social worker. Now, that's paradoxical to what I'm advocating here. I'm, I'm concerned about rural health psychiatry, but I'm also advising you not to do that. Why? Because our moves are going to dictate in future how we define the structure of mental health. We cannot promote something which is not even good for patients. We cannot, you cannot practice psychiatry nowadays as an isolated specialty. It's community-based now. It, the, the, the future of psychiatry is community-based psychiatry. And we have to advocate existence of multidisciplinary structures which provides better opportunities for the patients and for the providers too. I think that's, that's where we go wrong in these rural areas. We're more concerned about establishing a local business for financial reasons, we're not concerned about establishing a service. So there's a difference between the two. Uh, dual, multiple, or overlapping relationships. 
like I said before, in my hospital, trust me, the mother is my clerk, daughter is my nurse, and son is probably security guard, and probably has some other relatives work. But that's their only source of income. Um, that's the only employer left. So what happens is that results in a lot of uh, boundary issues. That results in a lot of confidentiality issues. The whole culture changes. You go to these areas, everybody's honey, everybody is buddy, bub, and that kind of, and then, you know, you gotta work with it. You gotta adjust to that. Your, your, your practice as a psychiatrist becomes very crucial because you're the one who's gonna implement those boundaries there as a professional, but yet, make it flexible enough so that it's not uh, the Kleinian boundary. It's more like intersubjectivity. People in rural areas want a subject. They don't want a doctor. They want to interact with a person. So I'm, I'm sure there are different schools of thought sitting here. Some are strict Kleinian dynamics. Some are more intersubjective. Some are cognitive. But to be honest with you, in practical life, your boundaries should be gel. You should, it should be able to adjust to your environment, yet there should be boundaries. And that's a big problem because of that dual multiple overlapping relationship issues. Multiple role requirements, yeah. When I, funny, uh, so I, I came in for my fellowship. Uh, department had no psychiatrist permanent. There was one permanent psychiatrist who was doing telepsychiatry. So this, the CEO of the hospital comes in, well, why don't you become assistant chief? Wow, I'm just out of fellowship. I'm assistant chief of psychiatry. Yay, and next thing you know, well, okay. It's because there is no one else to do that, and they want someone to do it. One year goes by, she leaves, and automatically, I'm the chief. Trust me, I don't want to be chief. <laughs> then, uh, now you can look at it as a positive or a negative, uh, because like I said, rural areas are blank canvas. You can paint your own picture. It just depends on how you approach psychiatry. Academics aside, you're in the best time of your life right now, training. Practical life is different. You've got to think uh, from all aspects once you get out of here. Uh, it took me a couple of years, but yes, the opportunity is so huge that at this point, I'm affiliated with three universities and doing my practice and yet doing inpatient. No big deal. Everybody does that. I'm, I'm not trying to say that, oh, I do this, this. No. I'm just trying to say that it gave this area, despite of its challenges, has opportunities out there for you. It's up to you how you approach and uh, look into it. So yes, multiple roles. You, you have to play multiple roles. Um, you have to multitask. You, you, my dream was uh, I'll do psychosomatic uh, fellowship, I'll work in a CL department and uh, do my outpatient based only on psychoanalysis because my training is primarily analytical. Well, I don't know when I'm gonna fulfill that dream, but whatever I'm doing right now uh, is secondary to the attitude I had to adopt. I could have either done my waiver and left after three years I was like, okay, let me grab some of the nursing homes, go there, visit them, let me start my outpatient in the evening, and let's get some students in, let some residents in so that I'm not isolated. Uh, I'm academically involved too. So it can go either way. So what are we doing to improve some of the mental health services? I think the most important uh, drive uh, in Kentucky, I know I'm not aware of all the states, but some of the states, as uh, we were in a National uh, Governors Association meeting in Washington, it's, it's a program uh, geared toward uh, helping states with their health policy. And in the last meeting, it was about super utilizers. And the uh, most important area of discussion was mental health, because some of the highest number of super utilizers. By super utilizer, I mean patients who come back within 30 days and are always in your ERs because of some random complaint. Uh, so the biggest thing which was that how we can have a hybrid model with the existence of this uh, 
beast of MCOs, as I call them. I'm, I'm not a big fan of MCOs, especially not in rural areas. So the, the eventual conclusion was that, like in Wisconsin, there are no MCOs. They have their own system, mental health system, based on fee-for-service. Uh, so the focus was to shift uh, psychiatry as a community-based, community-integrated service with within the rural health clinic. And that's how it's starting to do now. More and more people are getting integrated into the rural health clinics, multidisciplinary approach, more community-based, uh, and uh, fee-for-service. And with the change on the political scene in Kentucky, I'm, I'm thinking that we'll probably be free of MCOs. But the, that leads to another challenge, whether we're going to be ACO or we're going to be a long-term facility. Uh, being provided those funds or not, but that's, that's something which we'll see after January. Uh, another thing is broadening the aim of mental health services, availability of evidence-based medicine. So yes, resources, availability of resources. How are we broadening the scope of mental health services? Uh, hospital core model, the one I work in, that's one approach. Community mental health center model, uh, which are comp cares, but comp cares uh, su are suffering from uh, funding. So rural health clinics are emerging because they're paid per diem, like lump sum amount of money. So basically they have more incentives financially to promote some of the services as compared to the hospital. Uh, again, the integration into primary care model. And uh, I don't know if you guys know, but some of the states, especially in New York, uh, they're setting them outpatients, which are CL outpatients, consultation-based outpatients. So the more we integrate psychiatry, and I believe in it too, the more we integrate psychiatry into our uh, primary care setup, uh, better off it will be. The inpatients are decreasing in size. It's only the academic setups which can maintain huge inpatients. But generally speaking, uh, if I was to run a private hospital, it would be stupid of me to maintain a 12, more than 12-bed inpatient psych unit. I would rather have a med psych unit where turnover is rapid. It's more beneficial financially. It's more helpful to the patients who actually need both medical and psychiatric care. And then, if you really look at it, your acute psych inpatient, most of the time, I don't know, how, much, how many beds do you have here? 14. That's pretty much, we have 100 beds. Okay, let me give you the demo. 100 beds, we're, our census runs from 80 to 90. Out of those 20 are those patients we can't place anywhere because there is nothing available for them out there to go. Uh, I know personally that seven of them are TBI patients. They're never going to change any more from their baseline. Nobody's willing to take them. That's a huge problem in Kentucky. There are not enough resources for these patients where we can send them to get appropriate care. There is no uh, center for disability available uh, per the population which needs it. There is one in Lexington, but how many can they take? Uh, and, uh, and most of the patients are those patients who manipulate their way into system. So if I take that population out, the patients who really need acute psych inpatient is never going to be more than 40, 50. So even in even running a hospital with 100 beds, that's my belief, I think, that those, out of those 80, 30 of those patients are just there because there is no other resource available for them. So yeah, I mean, integration, primary care model, uh, it's just coming. When I was doing my residency in New York, uh, the focus was on community-based psychiatry. They started a fellowship in community-based psychiatry. You cannot take away, because like, these patients do much better with better support system. Their compliance is better. Their prognosis gets better if they have appropriate support system outside. They're not going to benefit hugely inside the hospital. I don't care if you keep them for a year. Uh, the assertive outreach or home-based model. Uh, this is, I don't know how it works in Tennessee, and it's kind of different in every state. But assertive outpatient and uh, AOT and ACT ACT teams, 
are two different things. Uh, I don't think we have any assertive outpatient treatment. In Kentucky, uh, what we have is when we want to commit a patient for uh, outpatient treatment, it has to be voluntary. The patient has to agree for that. Uh, so the AOT is still very primitive. They're coming up with ACT team, which is a good approach in these community outreach areas. There are some areas where you can't even reach, and nobody can go there in the hollers and all that stuff. So what ACT team does is that, okay, they take up a patient, follow up on them on a regular basis. If they're missing appointment, picks them up, takes them there. The another initiative we're working on, and um, if, if state, with state's blessing sometime, are the mobile crisis intervention units. And do you guys have such thing here? Mobile crisis units. Generally, a mobile crisis team is one uh, therapist, anybody who can intervene therapeutically, and one provider, and uh, one assistant, three, three people team, goes into outreach remote areas and intervenes at the first call. And from there, if the patient needs further care, bring them to crisis intervention unit. So that's another thing which is being started in Kentucky, uh, crisis intervention units, but they're not working the way they should be. A crisis intervention unit should be your first gateway. Uh, patients should come in, get, should get acute management, and should be placed from there if it doesn't need to be in the hospital. Or if needs to be in the hospital, should be placed into the local hospitals, wherever. So yes, it's, it's, at least it's starting. So I'm hopeful that the ACT team and crisis intervention units will establish themselves. It's very crucial to have these two services and mobile crisis teams in rural areas in, in particular. You cannot, you have to distribute and focus your resources on something which will have a more effective and comprehensive access to those people which to begin with have diminished access to these resources. Plus you don't have providers anyways. Secondary prevention, again, this is community-based step. You have to have community-based programs integrated into the primary care. Inpatient community-based services in between specialist mental health care and primary health care. Uh, our dilemma, like I said, the comp care is due to lack of providers. Uh, most of the patients do not get seen in the due time. So that needs to be improved. The, what, what are we doing about this? What I've told my hospital is that Stop controlling your psychiatrist and let them practice afterward. Refer your patients to them because they have already seen them. Let them maintain the continuity of care. Uh, I, what we have started doing now is I've told them no point in giving two weeks appointment. Find what works best for us. What is the average time that our patient gets to see a provider? It's about a month. So we have started giving out meds for a month. It helps in reducing recidivism rates, but it also helps to maintain them in community. Because there is a huge resource drain by keeping some of these patients inpatient. I mean, I'm talking about drainage of millions. Not that it should concern you at this point, but you cannot help someone when you're destroying your own structure. You have to, you have to uh, mutate your structure according to your own needs. That's, that's what they need to do in rural areas. You can sit in any big city and uh, claim that in Howard we do that, in Columbia we do that, or in NYU we do that. That doesn't work in a city of 5,000 or a county of 60,000. It's not going to work. I'm sorry. Uh, recognition of mental problems early stages, early diagnostic, yes. Again, importance of having mobile crisis intervention. Go right at the spot. Stop diagnosing everybody with bipolar. <laughs> Stop diagnosing everybody. The worst diagnosis our community ever came up with, in my opinion, and we do apology, is schizoaffective disorder. Uh, and I hope it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but anyways, resources to overcome challenges of mental health in rural areas. Satellite services, we, we talked about in mobile visiting teams. Telepsychiatry. Telepsychiatry originated from prison system. It's very good for outpatient. I'm not a big fan of it as an inpatient, but if you can use it, use it. It's a resource. When you don't have an option, I don't see anything wrong with it. 
Patients generally, when they're an inpatient, they don't like it. They, they, again, the whole concept of subjectivity, it's more important in rural areas where they have close-knit community. They want a subjective presence. They don't want objective mirror. They don't want to look into mirror, unfortunately. So what they want is a person. They want to associate. They want to develop a relationship. So that's crucial. One of my, and I, and I would suggest to all the residents that when you're learning therapy, before going into what model or theory or uh, whatever you want to follow, learn therapeutic alliance. That's trans-theoretical. Single most important thing which will help you with your psych patients is therapeutic alliance. And this is the time to learn because literature states the longer you keep practicing one way, lower the chances of ability to develop therapeutic alliances. So yeah, develop skills to have good therapeutic alliance with your patients, empathic listening, focus on transferential, counter-transferential issues. Be, be able to develop that relationship with your patient. That's very, very crucial. So telepsychiatry uh, can be used Inpatient, if nothing else, is available, especially in areas like ours where we don't have providers. Yes, we can utilize it, but it works perfectly for outpatient setup. Yes, you can have satellite services, uh, do outpatient services. You can always have some sort of nurse practitioner or PA kind of be present with their patients over there, and uh, a provider can, via telecom telecommunication, can do the med management. It, it, it is successful in outpatient, actually. More, more recently, realizing that shortage is there, uh, the reimbursement is getting better for telepsychiatry. It was a big hassle to get reimbursed for it. <laughs> Team-based approach, social worker, psychologist, case manager, nurse practitioner, physician assistants. I think that, that is probably true for all the psychiatric inpatient setups and outpatient setups. You can't, uh, you need a team, uh, whether it's out in community or whether in patient. So, you need an integrated approach. Uh, just don't think that you have to micromanage everything. That ruins everything. When you're working with a team, uh, there is an unspoken hierarchy in team, yeah. But uh, each individual should be proactive in their own job. I don't want my social worker or discharge planner coming up to me last day, what do you want me to do? I want my discharge planner social worker to have a discharge plan from the day a patient walked in, because that's your job. My job is to manage medications. I'm not going to micromanage you, but when it comes to the discharge, it better be ready. So your team organization is important. It's easy to put these things in there, but how you organize that is very crucial, especially in areas where the services are low. You need an advanced time to find something for those patients to go to. Because trust me, there are patients in our hospital for years, two years, three years, just because there is no place they can go to. Okay, uh, networking arrangements between larger mental health services, smaller mental health services, from urban services, large regional. I think I, the best example I can give you for that is our affiliation and association with UK. Uh, which is very helpful in extending some of their services onto us and we have developed some sort of system where we're able to transfer patients uh, for one reason or the other to Un uh, University of Kentucky because they have more resources available. So that, that, uh, that relationship is very healthy. Also in Kentucky, uh, state hospitals, there are three state hospitals, Eastern, Western Central, and then ours, which is partially states so of four. So we have catchment area, so let's say if the patient is catchment of Western State, we can do a change of venue between the hospitals. That kind of helps us to share the load of such uh, complicated patients. Mobile visiting services. Uh, again, mobile crisis team is very important. Take services to smaller, more dispensed communities which are without access. Now that, that, me and you are probably not going to do it without any 
structure existing. So we need to have structure for these services. If you're thinking about satellite clinics, you need to have ancillary structure with it. You need to have a mobile crisis team. You have need to have a team which comprises what we just talked about, social worker, discharge planner, nurse practitioner, or PA, and a clinical nurse, which is trained in psychiatry, actually. Another problem, actually. Most of these hospital and rural areas utilize staff on every service. You can't expect a ICU nurse to come and manage psych patients or vice versa. But it is just such a general shortage of staff that that happens in some of the hospitals. Um, again, telepsychiatry. Talked about it. So, how we attract you guys? <laughs> now, that's the good part. Uh, loan repayment program, recruitment incentive, relocation, JVN waivers, public health service grants, national health service corps, and certain programs, federally qualified health centers. <coughs> All these are good. Uh, and they pretty much exist in every state. But for residents specifically, uh, when you're looking for a job, first of all, you got to know where you really want to go eventually. What, what do you want to do as a psychiatrist? Uh, you want to stay in academic setup? You got to make decision. Yes, stay in academic. The financial rewards are probably not as much as they are in private setup. But then if this is what you want to do, then there are other rewards to academic involvement. On practical side, especially for residents who are going to be, is there anyone who's going to have to do a waiver here? Or everybody is OK? Right. Well, mostly, if, if, if you are in a situation that you have loans and you want to work, get rid of that loan, these underserved areas, most of the time, they'll provide you the opportunity to pay a loan in exchange for working for some time for you guys. There are waiver programs, like I said, Conrad 30, Appalachian Commission, and there are a few others. In this, Midwest has the most dedicated seats because they have the highest number of unserved areas. So there are a lot of commissions which give you these seats where you can apply. And then there are some grant programs which you can achieve through your schools or through your academic institutions to work in rural areas, and they can support you in those. Uh, limitations. Most of the psychiatry residents are trained in urban areas, true. Limited exposure to rural areas, that's true too. And uh, a lot of mental health programs, not only in Kentucky, but across the nation are closing. Uh, not because they don't want to train residents, they're in severe shortage of residents. I think the main reason for that is uh, financial and poor parity. The parity in most of the states is extremely poor for mental health, and I think part of it is uh, uh, a lot of it has to do with how we organize ourselves as professionals, too. Uh, and then there's huge difficulty in recruiting physicians, but even bigger is retaining them. Obviously, when you go for a job, you look for good school district, you want a social life, you want reasonable income. You can't have it all. You got to pick and choose. I mean, I have a family. I have three kids. Thankfully, the school district is very good. They're doing pretty good over there. But really, I had no intention of staying more than three years as well. I'm not going to say that, oh, I thought I'm going to serve the humanity in rural areas. No, that was not the plan. The plan was three years, I'm out of here. But uh, during that time, I realized, again, I'll come back to my uh, analogy that it's a blank canvas. You can paint your own picture. Opportunities are endless if you want to avail them. But if that's not something which is in your future goals, then rural area is probably not for you. OK, before we move on to questions, uh, I'm glad my resident made it. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Krishna. He's a family practice resident, family medicine resident. He rotates. They rotate with us for their CL or in psych requirement. So if, if, is it OK if he takes a couple of minutes and shares his experience as a resident? How is it like for you to work in Hazard? Because you were not from there. So if you can just take a couple of minutes and tell them. It's pretty much uh, afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm from India. Landing up in uh, rural Kentucky was a pretty different experience. 
it took me a few months to get uh, used to talking to patients, get to know them well. Uh, initially, it, uh, it was a big problem of communicating uh, across the background. I'm from a different background. Uh, You're fine. So uh, most of the most of the uh, problems were like compliance with medications, uh, the drug problems, substance abuse, uh, and uh, most of the times uh, it took me a few months to get to understand a patient. Uh, what, what are the socioeconomic problems? There were transportation problems. We refer patients to specialists, but they don't get to see them. So we used to wonder why they are not keeping the appointments. So transportation was one of the. So problems. you're working all in one. You're kind of working as a specialist, as their prime. Again, the prime example of how even at residency level they have to adapt multiple roles in clinics. How's it going for you now, after two years into residency? Uh, it's been pretty good. Uh, now I'm able to communicate with the patients better. I get to know them better, and uh, it's a very easy job now. Previously, it used to take 30 minutes, uh, even for simple problems, but now within five minutes, uh, I get to know what's going on with the patient. Well, part of it is probably because of your training. Would you consider staying here, though? Uh, well, I'm on J-1 visa, so I definitely got to do a J-1 waiver job, so I'm, I'm planning to work there. I plan to do an ER job for three years after my residency. Okay, cool. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for this good job. I appreciate it. Any questions, please? I'm so glad you actually made it here. I know you were scared on the schedule last month and I think, or something that got changed. So I'm another, glad to see that you're here. Another charm of being a J1, and I'm glad no one is J1 here. Don't be on J1. <laughs> okay. um, and, and I spoke, misspoke when I said we only have 14 beds. That's just one of the units. That's the unit okay. that ETSU manages. Okay. But the actual psychiatric hospital has several different wards. So this got yeah. probably closer to, I don't know, what, what? 84, 84 beds. So closer to 100 is what I figured. Um, and some sub-specialization sub within that. But what I think was impressed me is so many of the difficulties you expressed about rural actually applies right here. Um, and it's all relative. I mean, is Johnson City rural when you can think about New York mm -hmm. versus Hazard in terms of Johnson City? I mean, so it's all relative in terms of that mm -hmm. and availability of services. But a lot of what we find also is patients that will come in that are revolving door because they don't have, they have that two weeks in, but they don't get the medication, or they don't have transportation to get it, or they can't afford it, mm -hmm. because they get on the best medicine that you'd want them from a side effect profile, but then they can't afford it when they go out there, or they prefer to use it for substances or something else instead. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Or their substance uses is what's Or they sell them. I was gonna say, that's what funds the, the family existence yeah. or someone else. Um, you know, the other thing that I was more curious about is, you mentioned that there's, um, less reimbursement in the rural areas as far as um, for the same services, which I was a little puzzled. Well, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, reimbursement is not based on mental health parity. Let me put it this way. It is based on what is your setup. If you're a rural health clinic, they don't care what kind of services you're providing, they'll pay you more per diem. But if you're a hospital, then Psych inpatients are paid fixed amount in rural areas. Like you, I don't care if you do ECT or whatever, you'll be paid fixed amount of money. Which, uh, when you look at the overall expense encountered by the hospital, is less, far less than they should give to the hospital. Or, if that's what they're gonna do, then they should give the status of ACO to the hospital to maintain long-term care too, but they don't do that too. The pressure is from MCOs. And MCOs don't want your patients to be in the hospital for more than two or three days. So that's, that, uh, I think it meant more on those lines, reimbursement difficulties rather than the amount itself. And the, the one other question I was interested, intrigued by was, you mentioned that you saw some patients that got, came across, I guess, state lines or whatever for benzos. But you mentioned you don't prescribe it and you refer them to primary care. I'm fascinated by that because one of the things that we find is a lot of patients come to psychiatry because their primary care won't prescribe it and they're expecting long-term care for very minimal amounts of benzos, like a milligram My approach of towards such patient is a patient to patient basis. I have patients I prescribe benzos to, but in her case, um, I was highly suspicious that she had to cross county lines to come all the way because nobody's, she apparently, and later on, 
on getting more collateral, I found that she was selling them and misusing them. So maintaining that level of suspiciousness and knowing the culture over there, uh, I don't want to be involved in a situation where she's using my green prescription and selling those drugs. But I do have patients which are on chronic dialysis, they're being on benzos for 20 some years, they're not abusing them, I continue to prescribe them. The reason, I refer them to comp care. The reason is that we're supposed to provide a referral when you discharge a patient. So I gave her emergency supply so that she doesn't go into withdrawal, gave her some referrals and set her appointment at the local comp care. But yeah, it's the patient selection is very important in these things. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the question. This is just a follow-up on the question about uh, lower reimbursement in rural areas. I imagine that your population base um, has a higher proportion of patients who are covered by some form of public insurance, Medicare or Medicaid, Medicaid and Medicaid, as compared to private insurance, simply because the unemployment is so high, people don't have employment-related insurance. Yes. Here's the question. You talked about how many people end up working in healthcare because that's the only industry. Mm -hmm. Does the insurance that your hospital provides to its employees provide adequate psychiatric coverage? No. No. That's, that's a huge irony. Yeah, it is. And here's what I suggested to my CEO, and we're working on it. I offered them that you don't have any plan for your employees to get any kind of mental assistance when they need that right in the prime of some traumatic event happens in their work atmosphere. Uh, they automatically find themselves in a position where they're either going to be fired or we can't afford to do that, so why not set up a service, an anonymous service, I can run that service for you, where employees of the hospital benefit from mental health at some reasonable uh, expense or uh, fee to the hospital. Uh, I don't want any part of it. It's not my private, but just realizing that thing, because here's very commonly, one of your staff member gets hit by a patient. Some patient uh, gets aggressive, or some nurse gets hit, some CNA, some PCA gets hit. There's nobody to talk to them. They have no other option other than to develop some sort of reaction in the long run which impairs their ability to be more effective for that patient. But if that can be done right at the spot immediately, uh, and somebody can intervene and provide them that immediate care, it can be helped. It doesn't have to be medication. It could just simple, simply be counseling. We used to do that in our residency program. Our department volunteered to do that for the hospital. And uh, we would do it for students. We would do it for residents. We would do it for and that person who was doing was not part of teaching faculty. So it was kept anonymous. So I'm hoping that our hospital can come up with something like that. But that's, that's, that's an irony. I agree with you. Um, it's my understanding that um, your newly elected governor plans to dismantle what, what amounts to be the equivalent of our TenCare, your Connect program. Mm -hmm. um, what impact do you see that having on your population? Let him come in office first. Uh, Eastern Kentucky has very strong influence on politics. <coughs> we'll see how it goes. He doesn't believe in anything, actually. He doesn't believe in MCOs, doesn't believe in ACOs. So I'm not sure what's going to happen. I think what I see happening is that it's going to promote the local businesses a little bit more in rural areas because, but then again, we're talking about going back 10 years rather than forward. So. We'll see how it goes. I mean, really nobody's sure yet how it's going to act out because it's, it's not eventually going to be him too. It's going to be federally dictated policy. Uh, CMS is very heavily involved in every day-to-day -day activity, what we do and how we make our policies. And the NGA program I was talking about is an offshoot of CMS at governor's level. So I don't think uh, he'll be able to just, you, you say a lot of things to win elections and to become chief, when you become one, then you realize, uh-oh. <laughs> okay. All right. So, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.